Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody know who Clark Kent is? Yeah. Yes. No. Transcend yeah. generations, right? No, no, Clark Kent. So, there's a little boy in California. His name is Clark Kent Abuega. Uh, he's about, uh, he's 10 years old. Now, yes, Jada, Jada, how old are you? She's 11 years old. So, it's Clark Kent Abuega. He's about the same age as, as, as Jada. And uh, what's interesting about Clark Kent Abuega, his friends all call him Superman, is that he, uh, he set a record for the, uh, the butterfly. You know what the butterfly is? It's a swimming event. It's a 100 meter butterfly. He swam it in 1 minute 9, 9.38 seconds, the world, beating the world record by a second. The world record was held by Michael Phelps. You know who Michael Phelps is? Yeah. Michael yeah. Phelps is like the greatest Olympic athlete of all time. He's earned 28 gold medals. He's considered the greatest athlete, Olympic athlete. And a little 10 year old boy beat him. And I think that's phenomenal. That, uh, Imagine, imagine the, the confidence this little boy's going to have in life. And he's already broken a world record at the age of 10. He said his whole, as Kurt Gowdy would say, you all know Kurt Gowdy, the baseball announcer. He's always known for his Gowdyism. This little boy's got his whole future in front of him. Uh, <laughs> see, you can imagine the confidence that this little boy has. It's important as Christians that we have confidence too, that we have confidence in our great God, that we have confidence in the scriptures, that we have confidence in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to address that idea of confidence this morning by looking at the, at the sixth chapter of the book of Judges. Now, remember the Judges. Judges is a book about, about men that, that they call Judges. And, uh, well, they, they can't judge, they can't make decisions in a court of law. But there are also governmental leaders who are some military leaders. And the period of the Judges is about 410 years. It, it comes from the time that you know, Joshua came into the land, into the promised land. And, uh, and it works today from, from that time until the time of, of Samuel, and Samuel and Lawrence, King David. So it's about 410 years of the Judges. So let's take a look at uh, Judges chapter 6. Let me see what we'll talk about. A man by the name of Gideon. We all know Gideon. You probably heard Gideon. Probably one of the most famous of the Judges. Probably the most well liked, uh, probably the one we relate to the most. And they have a, they have a bunch of people called Gideon who so leave Bibles in motels and hotels. And, uh, that's that's the name of the organization after this man Gideon. So, catch your back, talk about the chapter 6. Yeah. Chapter 6, verse 1. And the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of the media is the soul press of these guys prepared shelters for themselves in, in mountain press, caves, and strongholds. Whatever the Israelites planted their crops in the Midianites in the middle of the place, and other Eastern people invaded the country. They camped in the land and ruined their crops and all the way to the Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, in sheep and cattle and donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents that swarmed to focus. It was impossible to come from men and their camels. They had given the land to their children. Many had souls that bowed their children's hands for they cried out. They got to the Lord for the Lord. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to talk about uh, our conviction of Christ and how we get a confidence in Christ. Uh, thank you for, for the example that we fight for these scriptures. We pray in the precious name of the Savior. Amen. Do you believe that there's still. We're still trying to talk, determine how the Russians uh, affected the American elections and the politics of the Democrats. The, the, the truth of the matter is they are able to hack into our election booths. They, they can hack into our... Uh, the, well, what's really scary about the Russians is that they can hack into our, our energy grids. There's over 100 energy grids that they can hack into. But that's what countries do. They often take advantage of other countries. And we saw this the last time, if you remember, when we talked about the... Uh, the Moabites coming in and invading the land of Israel with the Amalekites and the Ammonites. They came in with their overwhelming presence. They would demand tribute. They would demand money, crops, or whatever from the Israelites. Well, this basic idea is happening again this time with the Midianites. The Midianites are from the east. They, they align themselves with the Ammonites from the south, or the Amalekites from the south. And they come in and they, they invade the country. And the, the Midianites are the descendants of, of Abraham. So the, the kind of brothers or distant relatives of the Israelites, uh, the descendants of Abraham, his wife, could, could tour. And uh, so, so they were just relatives. But the Midianites come in 
And they just, they don't kill the Israelites. They don't fight them. They don't do anything. They don't make, take military action. They just ride in and take off the crops. They take off the food, the produce. They just, they just take everything. They, they come in on camels. And camels are the, what we call the limousine of the, the age of old. It's the first time in history that we see camels used in a kind of military way. The camels, camels can uh, travel up to 100 miles a day. When Mel and I go on a vacation in a couple of weeks, I find, it, I find it difficult to go 100 miles a day like, in a car and always drive a car. But the speed, the rapidity that, that they go through these, 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 the land, they just take what they want. They take the grain, they take, they take the crops, they do whatever they want. The Israelites just seem, there's nothing they can seem to do about it. They just, they, they hide their crops. They, uh, they put them in, in, in mountain clefts, or they, they take them and put them in dens. Or somehow they, they try to hide them from, from the oppressors. But they come in and they take what they want. It gets so bad at one point that Gideon is in, in his wine press. He's, he's grinding out wheat in his wine press because there's so little wheat for them to grind. Usually they have these, these kind of large areas where they have these large threshes to, 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 uh, to grind out the wheat, to grind the chaff from the wheat. But he's reduced to doing it in, 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 in a wine press. So, so they, they oppress the nation. And, and, and the text says that they're, they're considered like locusts. Locusts are like little, uh, they're like little grasshoppers with short horns. And, uh, when there's a drought, and then it's followed by a time of the lot of rain, something in the mind of these locusts that triggers, triggers something in the mind. They just start to follow them. They just take locusts with them and they just devour it. They develop the plants, crops. They didn't get anything except. And that's what it's likened to. It's just these, these people, these Midianites are coming in, they're, they're, they're taking everything. For nine years, they're just taking everything away from the Israelites, and there's nothing we can see to do about it. And they're just lost, well, what are we going to do with any food? It would be like uh, you and I going into White House, and going into the store and just fighting because it's empty. How are you going to live? How are you going to eat? What are you going to do? That's the way they feel they feel that they're oppressed. The question is, why does God do it? Why does God allow it? It's 2000 verse 6. Verse 7, When the Israelites cried to God because of the Midianites, he sent them a prophet. He said, This is what the Lord of the God of Israel said. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the land of your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you the land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God, do not worship the gods and the wicked Amorites in whose land you will live, but you have not listened to me. I don't know if there's a, uh, there's a Bethlehem shift in, in our country. I was listening to a woman running for political office the other day. I couldn't believe what she was saying. I, I don't know who the woman was. I don't know what office she was running from, running, running for. But she says, you know, the people on the left are right wingers. They're always calling us socialists. Why don't we just admit we're socialists? And we want a socialist country. <laughs> it's just this Bethlehem shift that's going on, especially with the millennial generation. I'm not sure what the millennial generation is. I think it's like the people that were born in 1990. 2005, I think that's the generation. But you think about what's going on in the minds of the they have colleges that can get $50,000 a year, multiply that by four, that's $200,000 a year, $200,000 for college education. They pay that on a credit to get $400,000 for college education. The price of housing is just sky, it's a sliver. Young people can't afford to buy houses, they can't afford college education, they can't afford houses, and the health care is just gone sky high. So, what's the answer? The answer is the government. The government take over college. The government take over the business. The government take over everything. That becomes our God. The government take over the country God. And you lost all contact with what the founding fathers taught about the free market and free enterprise. And about how God will take care of our country. And I think that's what the Bible teaches to. It teaches the free enterprise system. You read the book of Psalms that uh, every man shall eat of his own fig tree and tend his own vine. It speaks of capitalism, it speaks of controlling the of God. So we, 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 we were slowly, incrementally moving away from God and moving to a system where we were playing with our government becomes our God. And that's what these rights are doing too. They're slowly moving away from what God had told them. Slowly, they're looking at what's happening with, 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 with the Canaanites and they look at the, the, the prosperity. And they look at uh, what's going on. They look at Baal. You know, Baal is a sun god. Or Baal didn't. I was responsible for all, for all life, I was responsible for everything. And Asherah, Asherah is the, uh, the moon goddess, she's, she's responsible for all the things. 
and the mind. So anyone can control everything. And so they, they've lost all kinds of they've forgotten totally about God, they've forgotten what God has done. So God sends them, the text says, God sends a prophet to them. The prophet begins to explain to them, you know, you've, you've forgotten God, you've never God, you know, all the things he's done in the past. And you're saying, well, you know, where was God? So, you know, God part of the Red Sea, and God went over the Jordan River, and he seems to be gone now. So they, they totally got away from it. They, they, they aligned themselves with the Canaanites. It's gotten so bad that we need to leave up the texture that, uh, that Gideon's own father, Gideon's own daddy, has faced his monuments to, to Baal and Asherah in his own backyard, his own backyard, or others too, his property. That's how bad it's become. The whole nation is enveloped with, with the Canaanite gods and the Canaanite system, and the Canaanite kind of gods. Better than set up this glorious country with God just to be a showcase of the whole world. So, what do you do then? Well, look at the amount of devices we learned about how to think your way through the book of Jesus. You see that it was for, you know, for four parts. First, people sin, then God allows them to fall into slavery, then there's supplication, and then he sends them to deliver. So they cry out now, God has put them into a lot of the situation to come into their presence. They've sinned. They've fallen into slavery with the millions, and now they cry out to God. And now God is going to you know, provide for them and deliver them. So, let's pick it up. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in the ocean, and then run over the road to the Philadelphia and the Philadelphia. Where he said, where he said, where he was flushing, moving the wine glass to keep it from the wind. And the angel of the Lord appeared to be it and said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But sir, he didn't reply, if God is here, if the Lord is with us, why all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our fathers told us about the Lord? And they said, did not the Lord have, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us in the hand of the head of the Lord. Well, the Lord turned and said, go in strength and have you, and save Israel out of the hand of the Lord. I have sinned. The Lord did it. How can, how can, how can you say this? My plan is the weakest. My plan is the weakest in the answer, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike out one of them in my spirit. Do you reply, if now I have found favor in your life, give me a sign that it is the reality, that it is really, that it is really you talking to me. Do you stand for the way until I come back and bring my offering to me? Say it for me. And the Lord said, I will wait until you do the journey. I have a friend uh, who loves to go to do it, he loves to speak, and he loves to speak about Christ and what he believes. And I was talking to him the other day, he's getting a little old, he's getting like a little bit just like a fall apart in his body. He says, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't, you know, my body's falling apart. Things are going so bad right now that I don't feel it. It's thinking about God and you know, how it And so there's, there's a reluctance sometimes. And sometimes we like we're just reluctant to speak about the things of God. This is Gideon. He's reluctant. He's a reluctant prophet. That's why probably for people who relate to him so much. We're so often we're reluctant to do the things for God and speak out for him. So Gideon, Gideon is a reluctant God. The angel of the Lord appears before him. But the, the, you know, the question is, who is the angel of the Lord? We, 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 we encountered the angel of the Lord back in the book of Genesis. And, uh, most, most Bible scholars believe that, but it's, it's a manifestation of, of God. That uh, most people believe that it's, it's actually the second person of the God, and Jesus Christ Himself, the pre incarnate Jesus Christ. So that's what we believe to about this angel of the Lord. This angel of the Lord, we believe, is in some sense God. In verse 14, after the angel of the Lord speaks, he says that the Lord is spoken to him, and the word the Lord is the touch of God to him, for the word of Mr. God. So the angel of the Lord is God, and he's speaking to him, and he calls him a mighty warrior, and he wants him to, to, to go out and conquer the Midianites. But what does what's getting response? I can't do it, Lord. I'm the least member of my family. My, my family is the least, the least family in the world of Manasseh. Manasseh is not one of the better, the better than the farm the tribes of the nation of Israel. So he's the least, he's the least, he's the least, he's the least members of the tribe. I often feel that way too, probably sometimes. How many guys use me, right? I'm just the way I'm doing it. I'm the least member of my family. I'm not, not proud of the important of society. So this is where he's reluctant. And he goes on and says, where, where, where have you been, Lord? We've been 
Sinners and even the signs and wonders. We saw signs and wonders during the time of yeah, with Moses. We saw times, signs and wonders during the time of Joshua. But Lord, we didn't see anything. Where have we been? Where have we been? Finally, we said, Lord, if you do something, Lord, just, just perform some kind of a miracle, Lord, so they, they know it's you. So we can see that you we see the reluctance of things. It's just, it's just reluctant to serve them. It's reluctant to be a God. So, so how does it work out? Anyone's here? Okay. Give me by your now I have found favor in your eyes. Give me a sign that it's really good for you. Please do not go away until I come back and give my offering. Give me by your now and I have found favor in your eyes. Give me a sign that it's really good for you. Please do not go away until I come back and give my offering. Give me by your now and I have found favor in your eyes. Give me a sign that it's really good for you. Please do not go away until I come back and give my offering. Give me by your now and I have found favor in your eyes. Give me a sign that it's really good for you. Please do not go away until I come back. is uh, something that uh, you all have said to me. And I, I always make a, uh, allusions to all the sports. You know, like football coaches, you know, at, at the halftime, it's got, it's got it's still a nervous case. This, this team confidence that they can go out and win the game. But when a baseball pitcher faces a bat, they has to have confidence that he can get that bat run. And the other side of the plan is a bat, has to have confidence that he can get that pitch. Confidence is important. So that's what God is still in the is instilling confidence. He tells him to take a kid and go slay it, make, make, make a meal out of it, and, 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 and broth with, with unleavened bread. And then take that, take that, take that meat and take that, take that bread and put it on the, uh, put it on a rock. And that's, then it's just totally consumed. This gives Gideon the confidence that he needs to do what God kind of asks him to do. So he goes into his father's land and he tears down the altars. Turns down the altar to Baal and then the Asherah pole. What's interesting to me is that he takes ten men with him. He must have been enormous size. It wasn't some little, well, some little idol that was better, but some of it was an enormous, enormous idol. So he tears it down and then builds an altar to God. But what's interesting is the reaction of the people. They were angry. They were angry as all get out of the kidney of the way he's done. This is how, this is how, how, this is how, how, how Baal worship is appropriate to the culture. But they're just as angry as anything. They want him to die because he's done this. And what's interesting is that Gideon's father says, you know, but can't, can't Baal defend himself? And if Baal is so great, Baal defend himself. And it, it just reminds me of the story of Elijah. In fact, 
that the prophets of Baal and Baal Kara. And what the Baal is, is that he really is guided to defend himself. And so then they say, they call it the Gideon, Baal, Baruth, which means that they all protect themselves. So what they're doing is basically mocking, mocking out uh, Gideon for what he's getting for what he's So that's the story. That's the, the point is this. Well, what, what, what can we learn from this about confidence? I think the one, the one area I think that, that we can learn is that, that you can have confidence in God. No matter, you know, we're, we're not prominent people, we don't have a lot of money, we don't have a lot of positions of prominence. But God is going to use us. No matter what, God is able to use every one of us, no matter where we are, no matter what station we are, to take confidence in God. God uses, God uses little people. We don't have to be one of these great players, glorious people. So God, God uses the least of these things. The other, the other, the other area that I see too is that to have confidence in God, to have confidence in everything about God, is, is to remember God. Do you see what, what happened with these people is, is, is they forgot God. They, told, they, they got so caught up in Canaan, I guess, and the, the worship of many great gods, that they totally forgot God. So they have confidence in God, always remember God. I don't know, it's really in Psalm, Psalm 62, last week, in Psalm 62. The Psalm says that he's laying in bed at night, just thinking about all the glorious things that God has done for him. Remember God, for the daily bread last week, too, but uh, in the days of the day, God is just, just right down. We can list of all the things that God has done for him. Keep track of them. We can do that list from time to time. We can do the comments from me. The other, the other idea I see in this series that time, uh, the things that are desperate at time, things aren't going well health-wise, things aren't going well financially, things aren't going well in different ways in life. God works it out, just like he worked it out here. God works it out all things that live for those that live God, those that are poor and those problems. So we can have confidence in God if we remember that God uses us no matter what station we're in. Always remember the things of God in the past and know that God's going to work out everything for his glory, no matter how bad things seem to be on earth. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning, Lord. Uh, Father, thank you so much that you're for confidence when we need to get to the right for even when things are bad, Lord, that we are just truly satisfied all the time. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Time to look forward to this prayer,